My name is Abdullah Hassan Pratt. Uh, I am an emergency medicine physician at the University of Chicago. Uh, and one of the things that I truly, truly have a big passion for is helping my own community for which I'm from. So I'm from Chicago Southside, right off 87th and Stoney, a little bit off 63rd and Cottage. And it's those experiences that I saw growing up on Chicago Southside from the murder rate to the drug usage to the high rates of abuse and sexual assault, but mostly looking at the high level of comorbidities, the high levels of hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, stroke that I saw in my aunts, my uncles, my friends, the neighbors, seeing people at the age of 40 and 50 have to have their legs cut off. Those kind of things are what really drove me towards being curious about what I can do with my love of science and my love of people to really affect some change and not just be someone who is complaining about the issue, but to volunteer myself in my very, very smallest, smallest of ways to be able to be uh, a potential helper in finding those solutions. My journey to becoming a doctor, I could say it started with the cliches. Um, Fisher Price, you know, med medical bag with the stethoscope and the otoscope and the ophthalmoscope that I had when I was just in kindergarten. I remember that show and tell, having that and carrying that around. And in fact, just got my little niece one of those recently. But um, I always thought that I wanted to be a doctor. I said it. I didn't. I thought I meant it at the time, but it really, really, really wouldn't be until I was closer in age to being um, in high school and in college that I would realize that it was actually a dream that was attainable. Uh, and it went from being a dream to being a vision when I started realizing how much I really, really, truly loved biology, how much I loved anatomy, and how much of a knack that I have for being able to make quick connections with people without having to know much about them or without them having to know much about me. So once I was in uh, high school, one of the big pivotal moments for me was uh, when I got in trouble one day. Um, I got in trouble for having a cell phone uh, on game day. I was an all-state football player at Morgan Park High School. And I remember having a big game and I, uh, my friend got caught with his cell phone and I took the heat for him so that I would get an in-school suspension and he wouldn't get his third in school, which meant he was out of school and couldn't play. Uh, but it was during that whole transitional period that I out-debated the assistant principal and the principal about rules and the purpose for it and how this all was just senseless. If you got a really good student who's missing class because of a rule you know, to help protect students and being able to have a cell phone at the time. Uh, but then one of the assistant principals, a young man, kind of looked at me and he said, you know what, I'm not even going to try to debate you. You're smart. What do you want to do with that intelligence? What is it that you're going to do to help change your community? And I said, I want to be a doctor. He said, you know what, uh, there's this great program called HPREP, the High School Preparatory Recruitment and Exposure Program that was at Northwestern School of Medicine that starts the next day. And he said, like, listen, man, I'm going to give you my boy LaDon Robinson's number. Uh, he's, he wants to go into orthopedics. He's a medical student now. You reach out, he'll get you in that program. Uh, I got in that program. Um, it was one of the best, best programs that I've ever been in. It really catapulted me uh, by introducing me to other mentors who would say, hey, here's another pipeline program you should apply for. Here's an internship that you should apply for after I did well in that program. Uh, and one of those that I landed was the uh, Pritzker School of Medicine Experience and Research, the SOMA program, uh, going into my last year of college. Uh, I was able to meet everyone I needed to meet during that program here on the University of Chicago's campus. I was able to get research that was vital and pick up research skills. Um, but mostly I was able to really refocus for the last year of college uh, and really start that trajectory towards medical school. I always knew I wanted to have a career at the University of Chicago, not because of you know necessarily its name or its prestige or colors, but because it was the big university institution that sat in my own community. When you walk outside the walls of the University of Chicago, it goes from being pretty glamorous, beautiful lights, gothic cathedral-like buildings, to the hood, to 61st Street, to 63rd Street, uh, areas that for generations have been known as gang territories. Um, the sides of the streets that now that this community has been gentrified would house hand-to-hand -hand drug deals. I couldn't walk on those sides of the streets. There were certain blocks that now have very many of the students I mentor that live on blocks like Kimbark and have great huge apartments that are nice and they love it. Uh, though uh, You couldn't live there back when I was growing up uh, and so some of my friends would you know, kind of deter me away from those areas when we lived over here. But 
um, that was the reason why I really wanted to have a career here. I wanted to be the one person who, you know, really kept that door open, the one person who could take the resources from the institution like this and redivert them to the community. And I can remember asking myself at those times when I was in high school, who here cares about me? Who here cares about our people? Who here at this institution really is fighting on behalf of the people at the lowest of the lowest of the low? And when I asked a certain physician that question one day, he said, you know what, if you feel so strongly about it, maybe that person should be you. Maybe instead of questioning and criticizing, you can be the one that ends up fighting and you know really, really helping address the healthcare disparities of your own community. And so from that point on in high school, I was dedicated towards making that my mission. I wanted to know what GPA it took to get in the University of Chicago. Going into college, my GPA wasn't that good. I was an athlete, I had like a 2.7 unweighted, maybe like a 3.8 weighted um, with the AP courses. But when I met you know, a certain dean here who told me while working uh, during the summer of my uh, year going into college, I worked here in grants, just delivering grants, you know, getting the signatures, and it was a really good job. I got like $17 an hour, it was a temp, uh, which was really good for high school. Um, he told me like, listen, students here don't get in with anything less than a 3.8 or a 3.9, without any MCAT score less than a 31, 32. So I knew that I needed to make some changes when I got to college and I was able to do so. Um, so yeah, so that was my journey to getting to medical school. I was fortunate enough to do that, uh, but just getting to medical school was just the beginning. Um, I wouldn't be able to anticipate that once I got into medical school that I would lose the person that was really the rock in my life, my older brother Rashad, uh, and today is actually his birthday uh, in commemoration. But in that summer of 2012 was a very, very bloody summer for Chicago. This is when Chicago re-entered the national stage as the violence capital, the murder capital. You started hearing words like Chirac being used to describe Chicago's South Side. And uh, unfortunately, in August of 2012, leading into the hardest year of medical school for me, which was my second year, my older brother was gunned down um, in our own neighborhood, a neighborhood that we thought was relatively safe compared to like Inglewood or the west side of Chicago. Um, and at that point, I had decisions to make. I had certain mentors and advisors that told me to take some time off. I had other people that said, you know, uh, keep pushing. Um, others that said, do what you wanna do, but the day that my brother was murdered, um, literally hours after I found out, somehow uh, my mentor, Dr. Bill McDade, um, who was the one who helped me get into University of Chicago for medical school, you know, helped me develop my residency plan and faculty. But he called me that day and, you know, short of just saying like, hey, I wish my condolences, the next words out of his mouth was that you have to use this. And, you know, he didn't give me a couple days, didn't give me a week, didn't give me some months to say. He said, this is going to be a time that you're going to look back at and you're going to hate yourself if you don't use these tears, this pain as something to really motivate your journey. And so I didn't really know what that meant, but at least it set a tone for me at that time. And uh, over the next few months, I didn't take any time off. I really tried to push through second year of medical school and you knowing that you got step one on the horizon. But one thing I started noticing is that people would reach out to me. My old coaches that I played grammar school football with right here off of 63rd Street, the Chicago Wolfpack, in the lot, you know, the field that the new Obama library is being built on. Uh, he called me. He said, you know what, Abdullah? He said, you know, I know you're hurting. I know how much your brother meant to you. But these young men could use someone. They're losing their older brothers. They're from these same communities, maybe even worse than yours. And if you could come and maybe do some coaching, maybe share your story, you know, I think that it would help them out. But I think he may have known, but I didn't know at that time that it was really me starting to coach those young men, give back and really hear their stories that refocused me, that stopped allowing me to feel like woe is me and that I'm the only one in pain. All of them had lost a brother, a cousin, a best friend, a mother to gun violence. And so it was really during that time that I realized that, yo, the only times I'm not thinking about my brother being gone is when I'm out here on, these field, on the field with these young men. The only time that I'm able to have a break away from that pain and that sorrow, even you know that was keeping me from studying, was when I was giving back to the community. It was that moment that I realized that, okay, this is not only something that's good for the community, but more importantly, it's therapeutic for me. Me being able to address the very issues in my community that bring me pain is what actually helps me get through myself and helps me actually overcome those same barriers, those same hurdles, those same traumas that oftentimes catch up so many of us young African-American and Latino students. 
um, and that led um, in the summer of uh, 2013 going into 14 to me becoming aware of the new community driven grassroots push for a level one trauma center at University of Chicago. Up until that point, since the late 80s, um, there hadn't been a level one trauma center on Chicago's South Side. And this is something that I grew up understanding. I lost two friends that I can remember being taken all the way from our part of the city to Christ, you know, which is outside of the city, 30, 45 minutes away, or Northwestern, which on a good day can take you 45 minutes, even with no traffic. Um, and I remember, you know, people seeing them get loaded up in ambulances, everybody saying, hey, they're talking, they're going to be okay. And then all of a sudden you, you hear that they didn't make it when they got to the hospital. And your natural thought is, yo, if it took 45 minutes to get there, what if that hospital was down the street? So when the protesters started protesting the hospital, I remember being on the wards as a third year and really saying, okay, well, what can I do to help out? I've been in pain. I want to help. At this time, as you can imagine, University of Chicago wasn't too big of a favorite for the community organizations. And likewise was it with my family, with my friends. But once many of them understood that I come from the same place, I've suffered recently and was still suffering. That year I lost seven close friends and teammates to gun violence. And so they kind of understood where my heart was on a lot of fronts. And I didn't come I wanting to be a leader. I didn't come wanting to take over anything. I came wanting to learn. I came wanting to understand how I could help. And fortunately, both the community groups that were protesting as well as the hospital administration was open to me. They understood, you know, the pain that I was going through and me wanting to just dedicate myself to something bigger. Uh, and the hospital administration through the deans of the medical school helped me understand all of the issues around why we didn't have a trauma center, what it would take, the payer mixes, the finances, the political ties that were keeping us from having a trauma center or the things that we were working on to get one. And simultaneously, the community groups helped me understand the, the real goals that were in play. They helped me understand the strategy that's involved, sometimes the cynicism that it takes to really make something happen and to keep pushing. Uh, and it was during that time where, you know, we were able to pioneer some um, initiatives that were successful. And though I only played a very, very small part, we are fortunate enough to now have a level one trauma center. And I'm one of the fortunate and honored people to be able to say I worked there, you know, day one. And to this day, I just got off of a trauma shift right now, taking care of people that oftentimes I know. Oftentimes I see a gun shooting victim now as an attending physician, and that person knows my family. They know me. They'll pull me out of the ER waiting room and say, hey, Dula, what happened to my cousin or to my little sister? And I would say, I didn't even know that was your little sister. I didn't know that was your family member. So it puts me on my toes to make sure that I'm treating everybody from the lowest to the top as a VIP. Uh, and that's pretty much the crux of you know my journey and how I've gotten here. It's not been easy. It's not been pretty. Uh, you know, though some people may look at it and say it's a success story. It's a story still in progress. That if it would have stopped now, I would consider it still a failure. I would say that I'm not having the impact that I would love to have. Um, and that's just me being the harshest critic on myself and wanting to see something really tangible for people who are so used to promises, are so used to guarantees and optimism, and then it falls flat on its face generation after generation, that my goal would be to be able to actually give back something concrete. And uh, that was the last words that my brother, the last conversation that we had was about me not ever forgetting where I came from, not turning my back on the people that got me here, and basically, you know, not selling out the block, you know, that I would always have to put on for the block, and if I did that, that I would be successful.